sentence. If you want to destroy a nation, you blame it for something. <laughs> that simple. This guy must be killed. Why? Well, I've got to tell you this later, why the reason. We've got to go out and kill him now. Hmm? In the period between 1919 and 1921, Germany proceeded in forced march to fulfill the payments. The German government printed paper Reichsmarks to buy up the greater part of produced goods in order to hand them over for reparations. Thus, since most of the production went toward payment rather than the development of the nation, nothing remained as a foundation to give value to the currency. In May of 1921, the London Steered Reparations Committee unveiled their second set of terms, declaring that Germany must pay 132 billion gold marks, an impossible sum. In October, after the failed attempt of German Foreign Minister Walter Rathenau to rework debt agreements with France, the Allies increased the pressure to pay the debt. In order to offset the loss of physical capital, the government was forced to incur more debt than the original reparations. By the end of the year, the built-up pressure of the debt and the consequent money printing became apparent as 262 marks were needed to buy a single U.S. dollar. In response to mounting economic pressure applied at the League of Nations gathering in Genoa, Italy, Foreign Minister Rathenau met with Russian representatives in nearby Rapallo, where a treaty was signed which would relieve Germany of the portion of its reparation payments due to Russia and improve relations between the two countries. This positive turn offered an escape from the ever-tightening British noose. However, such a promising agreement was not tolerated. Two weeks after the signing of the Rapallo Treaty, Rathenau was assassinated. Within four weeks of the Rathenau murder, the mark dropped from 345 to the dollar to 1,254. By the autumn of 1922, the ability to pay the financial debt was dwindling. In the face of collapsing wages and the continued need to service the debt, the government was forced to rely on unrestrained money printing, and the mark continued its fall. This dramatic increase in monetary aggregate required bills with higher face values than ever before. In January 1923, despite breakthroughs by Germany in diplomatic initiatives towards reworking the debt agreements, the Ruhr region, which produced three-quarters of Germany's coal, iron, and steel, was invaded by Allied troops. Refusing to yield to military occupation, the German government encouraged the entire working population of the Ruhr to go on strike. Production was completely shut down. The loss of this strategic area was beyond devastating and had three related consequences. First, the severing of the Ruhr from the remainder of the German economy was a conclusive stripping of the income stream that had been used to feed the financial debt. Second, the rest of Germany suffered huge increases in unemployment. Third, in order to financially support the entire working population on strike, the government was forced to further accelerate the printing presses. Under these conditions, the concept of saving money became an impossibility for the German people. On the contrary, the more quickly it could be spent, the better, so as not to be left with a handful of worthless Reichsmarks. Wheelbarrows became the common mode of transporting money to buy essential foodstuffs, which were becoming more expensive by the minute. In the face of such circumstances, many sought refuge in the wild frenzy of a culturally degenerate fantasy world. Others, equally deluded, engaged in obsessive gambling and speculation, some attempting to make a profit by betting against the Reichsmark in the currency markets.
In the spring of 1923, inflation was in full bloom. By June, nothing could stop the mark. Waves of strike broke out due to collapsing wages. Unemployment skyrocketed. All aspects of daily life became focused solely upon survival, all savings disappeared, and nearly all income was consumed in simply preventing starvation. Printing presses were run day and night to keep up with the demands of inflation. The hyperbolic expansion of circulating marks was mirrored in their devaluation. By the end of the year, the mark had lost all its value. The German population was drowned in a sea of worthless money. The magnitude and rapidity of this blowout of the German economy necessitated the invention of a new term, hyperinflation. With a disintegrated monetary system, Germany had nowhere to turn save a political solution. Yet the question of whether this solution would preserve Germany as a nation-state or whether it would become a mere geopolitical tool was left entirely up to the British Empire to answer. The so-called solution to the Weimar madness was to bring in Hjalmar Horst Greeley Schacht, German by birth but not by breed. His closest collaborators consisted wholly of Wall Street and London international financial circles, such as John Foster Dulles, J.P. Morgan, Avril Harriman, and Bank of England head Montague Norman. Loyal to his kind, he catalyzed the further dismantling of Germany as a nation-state. As newly appointed currency commissioner, and soon to be president of the Reichsbank, Schacht introduced a new currency, the Rentenmark, which was fixed in value. At an exchange rate of one trillion marks for one Rentenmark, citizens handed in their entire money supply for a handful of Rentenmarks. Schacht's policies brought an end to the hyperinflation, but only by means of imposing a severe hyperdeflation designed to further secure the payment of the Versailles reparations. Thus, instead of feeding the monstrous debt with worthless ink on paper, the reparations would now be directly stripped off the backs of the already starved population. In the name of balancing the budget, any type of so-called useless spending was to be cut. Cuts in credit to industries and a dismissal of 397,000 civil servants were accompanied by the enforcement of high taxes and increased union busts. In addition, Schacht's entrance into power was accompanied with the full realization of his long-planned privatization of all German industry. New York and London financial vultures and their international syndicates quickly swept in to pick the bones of what remained of the coal, steel, iron, and chemical industries. Those same industries, under their new foreign controllers, would soon become infamous for their inhuman labor policies. As any moderately sane people would actively resist such inhumane policies, Schacht searched for an entity who would have the stomach to adequately enforce their execution. The remedy for the inadequacy of the current police force to carry out Schacht's purpose finally came in 1933, when the London and Wall Street cabal merged in slime-mold fashion to finance the election of Adolf Hitler. Europe was again launched into savage austerity and world war. Germany 